I wish to thank our partners, ProShare and Deal HQ, for all their contributions to us putting this webinar together. The speakers and the participants for taking time out to be part of this. Since we are all in a comfortable location and know where the restrooms are located, I therefore call on Mr. Ayobankoli, our moderator for today's discussion, to move this webinar forward. Thank you. This event is focused as discussing, we're going to be discussing how MSMEs can respond, effectively respond to the crisis situation that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused in the Nigerian economy, especially for SMEs who do not necessarily. And, uh, uh, and our speaker list is um, very rich across various segments of the economy, um, banking, consulting, uh, technology, to share ideas with you on how uh, you can, if you own SME or you work with you know, any of the MSMEs, how you can best respond to uh, this to this crisis and position, better position your business for uh, 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 the the era post COVID. Uh, so I, I'm going to go straight to to our first speaker, Isiri. Isiri, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me, Ayo? Yes, I can hear you, Isiri. Okay, awesome. According to a PwC report. Uh, I mean, luckily you work with PwC. Uh, I, guess, I think you're the second person on the panel that I've worked in the same organization with. Uh, and I mean, I, I, it's, it's good to have you on this panel. MSMEs account for about 96% of Nigeria's businesses and 84% of our employment. And that shows the strategic importance that they play in our economy. Uh, so their survival essentially is critical to our economy. If, if they die, uh, the economy essentially collapses, uh, especially the period after COVID where uh, the entire world will be struggling to survive. So aids and support may not come in in heavy flows as uh, is usually done. So, so what are the buffers or windows that exist for MSMEs to alleviate their tax and other regulatory obligations in the face of this of this crisis. All right. Um, thanks, Ayo. So, um, just before I um, expand it on the tax measures available to alleviate, maybe just to bring the picture closer home. Um, and I thought to also just um, drive it home. You know, speaking a bit about you know the pandemic that we're facing now. It's one pretty much unusual, it's unprecedented, it's not something that we're all accustomed to. And so we don't have the answers um, readily for any single SME. And, and responses definitely would have to be tailored or customized based on the specific needs of those individual SMEs. Um, one thing we've also noticed, we have um, a survey that we did um, quite recently, and the media tenure for any CEO um, is, is about five years. So the last pandemic we even had was um, the SARS outbreak, which was in 2003, uh, that, that infected only about 8,000 people and lasted nine months. Um, COVID is much more, 10 times more, and it's spreading fast. And so just painting that picture, you know, what comes to mind, especially for leaders of all of the SMEs that we have in Nigeria, is how do we, how are we even prepared to deal with anything like this? And there's no rule book on the preparation that's required, but there are practices that we've gained from previous incidences that can be applied here as well. And then specific um, addresses or solutions that have been made by governments, um, which I'll share. I think one of the key things around taxes, because tax is a big issue, and a big issue because with the pandemic, one of the key things we'll be suffering is um, a spike in unemployment. There'll be a lot more people unemployed. So you're thinking through how do you retain those people, but also the payee taxes associated with those individuals. And sometimes 
some organizations actually take the heat for those um, personal income taxes for their individuals based off of the contracts that they signed so that they then become additional costs. Liquidity is also going to be a big issue and still continues to be. And questions around that would be, you know, where do I even get the cash to pay the corporate taxes that are due me um, and at the right time as well? To the extent that you're not paying them at the right time, then penalties and interest kick in. And then that just becomes an additional cost for the business. Some of the palliative measures that the government has put through have been encouraging, but of course still need to be improved upon. Um, and some of them relate to just the extension of time for filing of returns. What I liked was the response from Lagos State, um, and that's fortunately Lagos State houses to a very large extent most of the SMEs that we're um, looking at. You know, announced an extension for the filing of returns um, so that you didn't have to file your returns at the end of March anymore. You could then file it um, within a three months grace period, which is good. Another thing as well that came through was with the federal capital territory. So we've seen that the big metropolis have responded rather fast to extend filing of returns. You know, some of the concerns as well that have been picked up with COVID are relating to, you know, just the welfare of our people, you know, how are we protected. And some of the interactions that we've had or continue to have is with the tax authorities and some of the measures that have been put through around social distancing and just ensuring that we're not spreading any diseases just because we've been called for an audit or we've been called to come look at a document. There have also been electronic platforms that have been put out by the authorities to just address those, which is good. Um, the other thing as well that I think we're seeing is the stimulus package that has been released by the government. Um, and that's been helpful to some extent. I'm not sure how many SMEs have availed of the opportunity that it presents. That's something that also needs to be looked at. And I'm glad that we also have a banker on the call, on the webinar, which may, we can also throw more light to that. So there's um, a facility that has been approved by the central bank. And that facility is supposed to be availed by SMEs and reduced interest rates of 5%. If you just apply, go to NERSAL's website, you could get you know, access to some of those loans at a very reduced interest rate of 5% with moratorium periods of about one year. So those are some of the fiscal measures that have been introduced to alleviate the sufferings. Um, penalties and interest have also been waived to the extent that you pay you know, your liabilities, the principal sum at a certain date, you know, and I think those measures are welcome, but there will definitely be need for improvement on some of those measures. And I, I think I'll just stop there for now and, and hand over the mic to, to Ayo, in case you want to expand on that question. Ayo. Okay, okay, thank you, Asiri. Uh, you, you, did a, you did, I mean, very good um, justice to uh, that, that question. Um, However, from your experience uh, in 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 in, uh, in this market, do you have some sort of introductory background or some sort of general content that you would like to uh, set the tone with that you would like to provide um, before before I go ahead with uh, you, you know because you know you have to give us uh, you, you have to respond to my question. I don't know if you have other. Uh, uh, content that you like to share to set the pace for other conversations that you may have today? So I think the other thing as well to be considering at this time, at least based on our experience, is just how nimble and, you know, fast and how quickly leaders should be making decisions, you know, at this time. Um, no one is ever prepared for a crisis, but the response that you provide during a crisis is what will take you through the long haul but also your recovery plan. You know, what are your plans for business continuity and all that. And from my experience, we run a global crisis center. PwC runs a global crisis center so that we've been dealing with crisis management even prior to COVID. But again, as I said before, some of the reactions or responses that will be required this period would be unique and some of them innovative and creative. 
And so what we find in most crises is that your largest asset for responding is really your workforce or your people. And so some of the responses you may find would be that people consider what's my biggest cost now? How can I reduce my cost? How can I contain costs because I'm experiencing cash flow issues? I'm not as liquid. I'm not as productive anymore. Shops are closed. I can't access that physically and all that. Is, you know, what's the right response? Is the right response really about laying off of staff or suspending them? And like I said, those responses will differ one company to another. But I think the general perspective or general considerations really around ensuring that leaders continue to communicate effectively during the periods of a crisis. You know, making sure that we're transparent about the challenges that the businesses face. And that communication needs to go be, 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 be pervasive, whether to the employees, whether to the shareholders, whether to regulators as well, or you know, to, to even your family. Um, so being, being clear, being transparent, and ensuring that there are no conflicts between internal and external stories about companies, depending on what trajectory you are on that growth chain is important. Um, what we've seen is there's a lot of stories just filtering the internet, some of them fake, some of them not true. And sometimes some of these stories are causing a lot of panic with the people who would be the greatest asset of your company. And so ensuring that we're aligning stories right is very important at this time. One of the studies that we've also done in PwC is around wide analysis on you know, perceptions and perspectives from different companies and organizations. And what they have found is that the level of trust that employees, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. The employees you, you would, yeah, would give, you know, to their businesses far outweighs what they would give to governments and media combined so that they trust more the companies that they work for. And this gives leaders in those companies a very good vantage point for holding on to their workforce and making them engine growth for their businesses post a crisis. And so in this time, communication is very important to hold that sail through. The other thing as well, which we already have a strength on in Nigeria is the sense of community. You know, just holding your people together and making sure that they don't feel unwanted and they don't feel out of that equation. So we do that very easily in Nigeria, which is good. Just checking up, how are you? How are you doing? It's as simple as that. The other thing is collaboration. And I think that's the place where we can gain a lot of advantage as a country from. And collaboration in the sense of not minding that there are chains of command in your organization, but identifying that each person has an asset and quality that's worth building on and strength that you can rest on as well. There are some times we consider that, oh, I'm so senior in the organization and I should be the one wearing the cap and leading the team all through to the end and providing the answers to the problems. Whereas your employees can just be a bounce off for some of the solutions that will come. It might just be the smallest in the organization. So to that extent, collaboration is very critical at this period. Staying together, it's our nature, very nature as human beings, that we derive strength from each other. And so that's, I think, the greatest response um, that we can ever give during the crisis. And then others will follow. And some of those would be, how do you respond very quickly to just shortages in your supply chain? You know, what are the alternatives that you're looking at? If you're not able to import from China anymore, what are the alternatives for your raw materials locally? Things around loans as well are things to be considered too. Liquidity, how do I stay afloat this period? What loans can I get? What interest rates can I get? What concessionary rates can I get from government loans as opposed to going to banks with huge rates? And good enough, some of the banks already have SME desks so that you can contact them. I think this is not the time also to begin to put out negative vibes and being too pessimistic. To the extent an opportunity is highlighted or identified, 
make the best use of it while it avails you. You know, other solutions may also be around cost containment. You know, how are my costs? What are those critical ones that I need to incur? What are the ones that I need to reduce or begin to um, extinguish at this point in time? And the good, the, the unfortunate tr truth is that in some cases, it might be that you need to suspend some contracts for some of your staff that may not be critical during the period of the crisis and then revisit them again later. Um, to the extent that you can even hold certain contracts, you do hold them. Um, but unfortunately, in Nigeria, we have situations where rent, you have to have paid ahead. So you may not be able to break some of those contracts, but perhaps negotiating as well with the landlords to say, oh, can there, that period be extended due to the inactivity that has already been experienced by COVID? Those are some measures as well that could be looked at. I think the final last point would be around engaging your customers and probably identifying strategies for rebranding during this period. And very closely, I'll link that to identifying new income streams because the truth is that this crisis is going to test a lot of um, a lot of points for businesses, and some of it may be around the revenue you earn and even the customer base that you're going to be able to hold on to. So to the extent that you find that this area is not something that we can still continue to generate revenues from, you should then begin to look at what are the alternatives for making money to stay afloat during this period. We've seen some people be innovative around even face masks, you know, production of face masks during this period. I think that's innovative and compelling, and that's, a, that's reflective of a business that will try and survive beyond this period. So. I'll close by saying that there is nothing that is above any human. COVID-19 will come and it will go. But I think that the ones who prepare and the ones who hold on to their greatest assets during this period and are able to sail through and manage and identify proper recovery plans are the ones who will come out on the other side of the road. So I, I don't know if that helps to, to bring at least some general concept around the topic. Um, I'll be glad to offer any additional um, um, perspectives if you would ask me. Thank you so much, Asiri. Sure, that, that, that does help. Uh, it does set the tone for a lot of, uh, a, a lot of our content that is yet to come. Uh, I think I'll give, I'll give our other speakers the same opportunity to uh, share, to, to set the tone for the conversation from their backgrounds and um, the understanding uh, of the topic. I, I'll start with uh, Tosin. Tosin, uh, uh, you, you, are a, you are a lawyer, and I'm sure that you deal with a lot of clients in this space, and you've also somehow been affected, um, either positively or negatively, by uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you share with us, um, can you give us some introduction to the topic and uh, what you've experienced? Okay, um, thank you, Ayo. Um, I'll look at this from different perspectives. So we do advise um, a lot of clients in the business space. Some of our clients are um, MSMEs. We are an MSME ourselves, even though we operate in the legal space. So I can talk both from our personal experience and also from some of the experiences that some of our clients, you know, have had. So the critical focus for any business in this period, I think, should be survival. And even more so if you're a small or medium scale business, because what that means is that then you don't really have the latitude of resources or the strength of personnel, you know, that the other big organizations have. So, I mean, one of the things that I think is most critical in this period is for us to have up and doing crisis leadership plans to see organizations through this period. One of the things that I have learned, you know, in my own personal experience is as a leader of a small organization, you have to be responsive with decision making. Your decision making capabilities have to be very agile. Um, what is right for the business today may no longer be right for the business tomorrow. So you must also have the flexibility to adapt to change as, you know, the circumstances, you know, change. You must be responsive to the needs of your stakeholders and the stakeholders could be um, your customers, 
could be your clients, could be your employees, or any other person who's um, who plays a critical role within your your organization's um, scope. I also think that, um, like a Siri mentioned, um, communication is extremely extremely critical in this period. I'd say communication and engagement. I mean, one of the very key things that we had to do for many of our clients at the very beginning or at the onset of all of this um, crisis was to start having you know conversations around handholding them in terms of communication with stakeholders in this period and like she also mentioned just being very upfront on the circumstances helps with all in your communication with all stakeholders and understanding your obligations i think so one of the things I was going to mention, which I think is critical, is that every business should, at the beginning of this crisis, have done what I would call a contract performance and employment and enforcement assessment. And what that basically means is that you should have sat down and looked at all the gamut of the commercial obligations that you have and try to dimension them and understand you know, what the scope of your obligations are whether you are able to still perform these obligations under the circumstances. If you're not able to, why you're not able to, if you're able to, to what extent, and if you, know, you find yourself in situations where, because there are two sides of it, there will be obligations that you have to people, and there would also be obligations that people have to you. So you need to take, keep track of what your obligations are to all your stakeholders, and understand which ones you are able to meet and which ones you're not able to, and determine why you're not able to meet them and how you want to deal with the fact that you are unable to meet them. On the converse side, the parties that have obligations to you, suppliers, uh, business um, solutions providers, and what have you, what, what are their obligations to you? I mean, in situations where they are unable to perform, how does it impact, you know, your business continuity plan are you able to look at alternatives are you having conversations with them i mean everybody is affected so i mean to expect that anyone will be 100 percent in terms of um, contract performance or in terms of meeting their obligations would be to my mind very foolhardy but the point is how do you ensure that you're able to still run your organization at the most optimal level that you can, bearing you know, all the circumstances. I think another thing that I would like to talk about is that at the end of all of this, we're going to see an emergence of a different kind of um, medium and small scale businesses. We will see businesses that would have gone through this phase and would have been tested in terms of their capacity, would have been tested in terms of innovation, and you will see very resilient, and very multi-dimensional organizations that would emerge and that would be even the better for the country and our economy. Thank you so much. Ayo, I hope uh, that. Um... Yes, yes, that 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 that. that. Um, I'll go to Mr. Mr. Soja Pampa. Uh, Mr. Soja Pampa, please can you share with us uh, from your experience? Um, can, can you set the tone? What do you think are the biggest issues facing new, new government intervention kind of vision from that angle? Okay. I, I think that um, this is a time that the government wants to intervene with the MSMEs. Or rather, this is the time that the government ought to intervene with the MSMEs. And why? Because there's no way a government, government spending by itself is going to jumpstart the economy back into productivity. We are in the mess we are as a country because our productivity levels have been so low. We have not been producing enough. We have been a major importer of almost every item across every sector. So even though our MSMEs are, um, represent about 96% of the private sector, we haven't really given them the uh, attention that they deserve. Now, why didn't we give them that attention? We've got excuses like they're not properly structured. Um, they do not really comply with regulations. Um, there's no real business con continuity. 
it's a one man show, one woman show. Um, they don't do proper records keeping. And we have a whole list of, of things, which is why when we had the SMEs fund, um, we were not very keen as banks to even loan any money to the MSMEs. And now we've come to the crunch where we must. So my first, my, my first proposal is that if you had um, the likes of um, uh, a Siri and from PwC, so let me use her as a placeholder for PwC. If you were to link 2,000, even 2,000 MSMEs to PwC, and you gave a billion naira to PwC, and the number of sectors in which they're supposed to become productive before the end of one year, I bet you you will get a much better result than if you had distributed that one billion into the hands of those same MSMEs. Because there is a level of incubation that will occur at the same time. There will be a level of due diligence that will still happen despite the, the tight timelines and despite the fact that it, it has to be spent through the MSMEs. Uh, so really what you need is a professional anchor. And we have played around with anchor borrower schemes, which we've done in agriculture, where one anchor could be represent, representing 10,000 farmers or 15,000 farmers. And I know the government has given as much as 2 billion uh, in loans to those anchors. So we should find a way to incentivize those who have the capacity to pull up the MSMEs and incubate them in this period. Because where we're going is for the long haul. Nigeria cannot afford to just produce for itself. In the medium term, three to five years, we must be a net exporter of agricultural produce. Data coming from the CBN governor was that I think Malaysia earned in 2017 about $12 billion from oil and gas, but earned about $14 billion from palm oil. And yet they got the seedlings from here in Nigeria. So it, it gives you an idea of the kind of gap that we have in exports because we, we have to be able to strengthen our economy and it must be based on production. That's number one. But the biggest hindrance to that would be the issue of data. Who do you know that you're actually giving anything to? I don't know why we have stalled the process of registering Nigerians and having a credible planning database. Now, it seems as though it's a lot of money, right? But the government is planning to spend 3.5 trillion Naira on infrastructure in the name of COVID. 3.5 trillion. And yet it will cost them only about 15 billion to register some 100 million Nigerians. Right now, since our records began, We've not um, registered more than 40 to 50 million Nigerians out of 200 million. And yet in a matter of 100 days, imagine you had a thousand people with handheld devices who could do 100 registrations in a day. So a thousand people per state, and you roll that out for 100, for 100 days only, you will capture more than 100 million people. It is possible. And now during COVID-19 is the best time when most people are actually home, not by their own choosing, but because they have to be. So we can change the landscape and change the story. Thank you so much, Mr. Avamba. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so, so we, we will now take, we'll go ahead to uh, Kim. What do you, what would you say is the, are the biggest issues that MSMEs have in this, at this time? And from your experience, can, can you just share with us some, some, can you provide some background, some contextual background that can set the tone for our conversation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayo. Um, so I think that in terms of um, MSMEs, um, you know, and their readiness for, for this crisis, especially with regards to technology, you know, we're really looking at um, infrastructural um, gaps and we're looking at basically you know, them not being set up for remote work, um, not being set up for collaboration, not being set up for 
um, you know, just basically serving their customers and creating a cohesive customer experience online. So I think that, you know, um, this is really the time where MSMEs um, and, and big corporates as well have to really think about their digital strategy and have to think about how they're going to position themselves, how they're going to position um, their customer experience um, for, for, you know, the, the near future because things are not going to um, completely go back to normal. Um, as we think about how we're going to exist in this low-touch economy and how we're going to exist in a in a place where in a place where we um, you know have a lot of um, a lot of issues in terms of actual physical interaction and digital becomes you know the the new normal and plays a bigger role. How do we get our companies ready for for that, and how do we ensure that we are um, you know set up properly? So I think that those are the things that you know customers need to look at. Um, companies need to look at. And we also need to, you know, um, dig very deep and see how do you engage with your customers at a time like this? What type of value can you add to your customers? Because a lot of businesses are unable to sell at this time. Does that mean that they just stop and not engage with their customers? Or are they able to actually engage with their customers? So these are all, you know, key challenges that are currently being faced by um, small and medium-sized businesses. Um, a lot of them especially um, businesses that are, you know, sort of in the training space have reached out um, to, you know, sort of figure out how can they take their training online. Businesses who are in the retail sector have reached out to say, how do we, you know, transition into an e-commerce first um, approach and how do we change our business strategy from brick and mortar to digital first? And I think that that really is the right approach. I think that that's what, you know, businesses need to be focusing on and they need to really rethink um, their their strategies and rethink how they um, engage both with their um, staff and also with their with their customers as I've mentioned before so you know for me it's 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 something that is not an easy feat especially because in these times most businesses are not earning so if you're not earning how do you actually invest in your IT infrastructure how do you invest in your digital strategy it's a really really tough one um, and I think that some of the, you know, government intervention funds and CBN intervention should actually focus on supporting um, SMEs um, to basically be able to invest into their technology and digital strategies and infrastructure and ensure that, you know, they, they can use that to grow. Because I honestly believe that with the right digital strategy, a lot of um, enterprises will be able to pivot, will be able to stay alive, and will be able to actually um, continue to add value to, to the economy. Um, and, and I think that that's vital at this point because the, you know, we're worried about big organizations, the banks laying off. But what happens when all the small businesses close? What happens when you know, all those jobs are lost? I think that impact will be even bigger um, and felt even wider. And you know, I think um, we need intervention around that. And as a nation, we need to start looking at our, you know, infrastructure. Um, you know, we can, even this call is showing us that infrastructure is a huge challenge in terms of, you know, um, connectivity and, and broadband. So we really have to, as a nation, strategically invest in that. We have to also think about access. How do we get access to as many people as possible? How do we also make sure that we you know, are using data and are, are taking data-driven decisions when we are actually making decisions and forming our strategy. And then also we need to, as a nation, invest in our human capital because if we don't invest in our human capital, there will be nobody to actually build this technology that everybody is going to need, which will then make us consumers of foreign technology. And with the you know, um, Naira that has completely plunged, it will be very hard to actually afford this foreign technology because if $10 is 5,000 Naira or more at some point, um, how do you cope? How do you cope with subscriptions? If you have to pay $10 per user per month, right? You will run into really, really big problems um, you know, because it's, it will be unaffordable to you. So we need local solutions that are priced in, in local currency. Um, but for that, we need to invest in human capital and we need to do that very, very fast and you know, at, at the highest urgency. 
we also need to look at our policies. How do we enable technology companies to scale? How do we invest in those technology companies? How do we create an enabling environment for those technology companies? How do we make sure that they have local funding available and don't have to rely on international funding that is currently mainly on hold? There are a couple of um, VCs um, you know, that are still investing, but the majority of people are, you know, have put freezes onto their funds. So what does that then mean for our local tech ecosystem that relies heavily on foreign investment? So we need to also look at that and we also need to, you know, sort of think about as a nation, what is our own digital strategy? How do we use technology to interface and engage with our citizens? Um, and how do we um, also make sure that our citizens are digitally literate? I think those are key areas that we need to look at as a nation um, before we even start talking about at enterprise level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nkim. And I like the, the last, um, the last uh, point that you made, which has to do with uh, how, how we can even ensure that our people are digitally literate. Uh, the, the truth is that we are still battling with, um, with the most basic level of uh, education uh, in terms of quality education at the basic level. Uh, and um, maybe a tall order getting our citizens to, uh, if we don't even have the infrastructure, how do you then begin to drive uh, digital penetration um, across the chain, especially at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and that, that then brings me back to uh, Tosin. Um, uh, I think a series sort of touched on some of those things. So I, I, would, I would ask, I would take this to Tosin. A lot of times, you, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, SMEs, especially uh, the guys who are on the small and micro end of the, of the, of the pyramid because a lot of times when we have these sorts of platforms, uh, some of our solutions tend to speak more to those who are the medium or, or um, yeah, a bit of the medium and already scaling enterprises. And then we sort of overlook uh, or we sort of are unable to really tie down to address the pain point of those very smaller guys. So, so I'm going to ask you this, right? Now, data, you know, data, facts don't lie, right? MBS says that over 97% of our micro businesses are not registered. And 75% of the small and medium ones have startup funding that is less than 10 million. And these are the guys who constitute an overwhelming percentage of our economy. So this clearly shows that, you know, these guys may not be able to have afford sophisticated legal services, and may be exposed to all forms of uh, uh, issues due to the unprecedented, you know, record of contractual breaches that we have, that we may have now due to this pandemic. So if MSME does not have sophisticated legal backing, does not have well put together contracts, what are the options that exist for them at this time? And for even the ones that have the contract, how do they protect themselves if they have gone uh, uh, outside of their contract due to unforeseen circumstances at this point in time? Okay, thank you, um, Ayo. I think that um, it's very needed for us to understand, you know, the demography of um, a lot of our um, small and medium scale businesses, and um, we are not, uh, we cannot be unaware that a lot of, a large percentage of uh, businesses that fall within this um, value chain actually do not have or do not have exposure to get legal support for the kinds of contractual, you know, transactions that they do. That being said, even within these, um, these, um, these um, arrangements, we still find that the small businesses are able to transact between themselves some of them have verbal contractual obligations that are established between themselves and their counterparties. And in those spaces, even much more than inside the conventional contractual arrangement, you will see that there is a very high level of trust. There is a very high level of commitment to obligations. 
a lot of people treat their obligations within these um, spaces as very sacrosanct. I mean, a lot of us, you know, have dealings with some of them, your mechanic, your tailors, and what have you. You don't sign a contract with your mechanic when he's going to fix your car. But what you do is you ensure that in the selection process for the kind of uh, service provider or supplier of good that you're going to that you're going to do, you try to look out for people that are trustworthy. And so building a lot of these businesses, you know, are driven on the back of trust. They are built, they are driven on the back of reputation and what have you. So a lot of times they are still able to function quite effectively within their space with the unconventional arrangements that they have. That being said, even with those unconventional arrangements and under the best circumstances where you know there's trust, there's commitment and what have you, we are in a pandemic situation and everyone and every business is affected. Nobody is immune. So if you did have contractual obligations, so for instance, say I'm a tailor and um, I had been contracted to uh, make a nice dress for some lady and I had the obligation to deliver the dress, say, at the middle of um, April. I probably live in Abuli Egba, and I have my shop somewhere in Ogba, and I haven't been able to have access, you know, to that location. And what that means is that the, the dress is probably, you know, somewhere in Ogba. I can't reach it. My machines are in Ogba and all of, all of that. The coloration of the, of the challenges are not different, whether it's within the unconventional arrangement or within the conventional arrangement. So what then do you do? You cannot perform. The same principles would apply. There is an incidental breach that would happen on account of the circumstances that you're facing. What, how are you going to deal with that? You're going to deal with it by ensuring that you keep you know, the lines of engagement open, that you are open and upfront with the challenges that you are facing that you do everything that is within your power to try to mitigate the impact of the circumstance on the third party um, client that is expecting service of you. And at the earliest time when you are able to deliver, you, you then try to ensure that you know, the delivery of that service happens. So that, that's basically it. The, 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 the penalty or the, or the downside for any business that is operating within the unconventional spaces, if you lose credibility in this period, if you would lose your clients, if you lose your clients, then you probably would not have any business to return to post COVID-19. Now I'll go to the conventional space, which is where you have, you know, the more sophisticated um, um, MSMEs, the, the um, mid-sized companies and, and what have you. So within this space, we actually do have a lot of people that have registered entities that have legal personality and a lot of the contracting that they do are actually documented written contracts, right? And in that, in that wise, you know, many times, you know, even within the MSME space, some of them cannot afford, you know, the best legal support that is available. But at least, you know, to a reasonable extent, you have some kinds of arrangements where there is, you know, some kind of documentation of the, of the, of the contractual obligations between the parties. If it is a, a, a service-driven organization, you would most likely have contracts that are signed at the time of onboarding a customer. If it's a technology-driven one, you probably would have terms and conditions, you know, that are listed on the, on the website of um, the service user or the service provider. Now, irrespective of the contractual obligations between parties, we are seeing ourselves in an unprecedented circumstance where businesses, the whole business landscape is collapsing and people are no longer able to even perform some of the basic you know, obligations that they have to their clients or their customers. And therefore, the question is, how has your contractual obligation anticipated this? If you have a formal contract with your customers, do you have any arrangement that indicates how to deal with these kind of circumstances? Many SMEs or MSMEs would not have contracts that may have anticipated, you know, these kinds of um, circumstances because, I mean, they are usually simple contractual obligations flowing through from, you know, one party to the other. And so I'm going to talk about one very um, fundamental principle of law that we need to apprise ourselves of. So apart from the laws 
that are applicable within you know, the country. There is a common law principle of frustration, which applies you know, effectively across every form of contracts that is in existence within the business landscape. And what is this? It's, it's principally a common law principle that is backed by established judicial precedents that says that irrespective of the obligation between two contracting parties or two or more contracting parties, where it is impossible or impracticable for one party to perform an obligation on account of a circumstance that the parties could not have envisaged at the time that they contracted you know, together, then by virtue of law, the party that is expected to provide a service or deliver on an obligation will be relieved of the obligation to, to, to perform that, contra that contract on account of the circumstance. Now, I must, I must establish that one, it must not be a circumstance that has been orchestrated or caused by that party itself. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it must not, your non-performance must not be based majorly on an inconvenience or a write up in the cost for performance. It must be that there is actually a circumstance that makes it impossible or impracticable for you to perform. In all of those circumstances, the law would come to the aid of the counterparty in that contract and permit a non-performance and a termination of the contractual obligation in that respect. Now, let me give some examples of what would, you know, um, qualify, you know, for this, um, this um, kind of uh, defense. One, if I did have a contract and I was, um, for instance, a consulting arrangement where I was supposed to go to the United Kingdom to provide some consultancy service to a company in London. So the airspaces are closed down. I cannot travel, right? So what that means, you know, in essence, is that there is no way that I can be physically present in London to perform that obligation. That is clear-cut frustration. Another example could be, um, so say that um, I have... I have an obligation to um, deliver a good to a customer or the example of the tailor that I gave before. The tailor is unable to get to the physical location where, you know, a client's property is or the resources that is required for performance is and therefore cannot, you know, deliver on that promise or that obligation to make a dress for a client at a certain date. That is frustration. However, I mean, there, there is one fundamental thing that we must remember, or that we must be mindful of. The law would also try to ensure that there is no unmerited or, or there is no transfer or gain to one party at the expense of the other. So if, for instance, the tailor has been paid, you know, the full value of the, the dress that is supposed to be made, and the dress cannot be made, the tailor does have an obligation to refund the money value that has been received because, I mean, there can no longer be performance. However, if there has been part performance also, so I have met my obligation halfway and, of course, I've incurred costs, the law is also fair enough to determine, you know, what is fair and adequate to be, you know, refunded to the other party or the counterparty on account of non-performance. So, whether or not you have a contractual arrangement that deals with circumstances like this, let's join that protects parties in this circumstance. The other thing I'll talk about is um, the doctrine of force majeure, which I know that you know a lot of you have probably heard, you know, in used in a lot of you know business conversations in the last two months, even much more than any other time. So basically, what is what is the doctrine of force majeure? It simply means that parties have agreed that instead of being bound by the common law principle of frustration, which determines, which already has a set criteria for determining, okay, what will be considered frustration? How would the law view this? What kind of protection will be there for a party that cannot perform? And what kind of protection will be there for the party who 
you know, has performed their own obligation. In, 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 the, in the first major circumstance, parties elect to define the scope and boundaries of frustration within a contract that they have signed. So we basically said and put in our contract to say, these particular circumstances will relieve the parties of obligation to have to perform this contract. And sometimes it will read like, okay, circumstances like act of God, a flood, fire, tornado, uh, medical emergency. Sometimes you even have, you know, as specific as epidemic or pandemic being listed as some of those um, circumstances. The parties would also determine how or what would happen if any of those you know, defined circumstances do play out in the course of the performance of the contract and how the how parties are expected to, re to respond. So for instance, if there is a contract that already defines you know, a pandemic or an epidemic, or a medical emergency as you know one of the one of the grounds for force majeure then we now need to determine so if it happens what do what does the party that wants to claim you know a force majeure have to do sometimes you have to give notice sometimes you have to show proof that you have actually suffered you know a force majeure event sometimes the contract will say that it will be deemed suspended until you know the force majeure event you know is no longer subsisting Sometimes it gives a timeline and says, if within a 30-day period, a 60-day period, or a 90-day period, the first major event is still continuing, then we will terminate. But, but Tosin, I, I, so, so sorry, I, I, so sorry to cut you. I just need to quickly clarify this. How, how often does um, uh, the first major clauses in accommodate uh, pandemics and this type of um, issues? Because I, I've, I've heard this debate uh, on media you know, several times, and th there doesn't so, seem to be a consensus. So, yeah. to be fair, I have had to do advisory on you know force majeure or frustration for clients in the last um, one month, maybe more than twenty, and I have only seen one particular contract that actually captured you know the scope of an epidemic or a pandemic as one of the circumstances. That being said, let me mention that the court would always, you know, look at the intent of the parties. So even in situations where you may not have specifically listed, you know, an epidemic or a pandemic as one of those grounds, it will look at all the other circumstances that have been listed and would induce whether they, there can actually be an established, you know, intention that those kinds of circumstances will be covered. But in fairness to you, I haven't seen, you know, a lot of contracts that have actually specifically captured, you know, a pandemic as, you know, one of the, one of the um, circumstances for force majeure. Just pretty quickly before I, before I, before I um, 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 wrap up, I think I should mention that, you know, a lot of people are under the misconception that the principle of force majeure gives a better protection to, um, to contracting parties. I must, it's important to mention that a lot of times there is always a party that has the upper side of the stick and a party that takes, you know, the, the, the lower side of the stick. And the law does not give any form of protection or deduce what should happen, you know, to, to, to support um, um, contractual parties through this process. It simply sticks with what the parties have agreed to happen. So, for instance, if the, if, if I go back to the scenario of Taylor, if you do not have in your contract an obligation that requires that Taylor to refund the monies that have been collected, and the contract, for instance, simply says where there's a first major event, after 30 days, the contract is deemed terminated and each party, you know, is no longer, you know, no longer has any obligation to the other. What that means in the strict interpretation is the Taylor can walk without having an obligation to perform, to restitute, to refund, or what have you. So, I mean, people need to be minded that every time you enter into a contract that has a force majeure clause, you need to look at how it would impact you as a counterparty in that arrangement if there is ever a need to, um, to um, enforce the contract. I know so many people right now that have force majeure clauses in their contracts and we are writing legal opinion upon legal opinion because, I mean, 
the companies are or the the businesses are in a worse state that they would have been if the contract didn't even have a force major you know clause at all wow so um I, I hope that that has um maybe you know provided you know some kind of context to the question but i'm happy to provide any clarification if um if required thank you i, I, I think thank you so much Tosin. that that's very detailed I, i'm very glad that it specifically speaks to those who are in the micro and small end of the chain because um, again as i said I, i've noticed this from my experience even at our event at the sme bootcamp that um, a lot of those who participate at these events, you know, based on the demographics, are usually are usually uh, those in the small and mi uh, micro space. But a lot of times, we are unable to, you know, zoom in to their pains. But but you've done you've done you've done um, excellently well. <clears throat> I must confess. I, I want to go back to a Siri. Hello, a Siri. Are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes. Yes, Esiri, while you were talking, you spoke about um, the need for business continuity. You spoke about uh, transparency and um, quite a number of, of, of things that touch on the realities that are happening now and what MSME can do. Um, but but I, I would like us to still take you through. And again, you also mentioned the obvious, which even though a lot of Nigerians are complaining about is, is inevitable, which is uh, having to suspend certain contracts, non-essential contracts, both for staff um, or, other, or expenses. And you know that would affect um, the well-being of people, to affect the well-being of businesses and all of that, right? Yeah. Now, government has been trying to provide palliatives. Um, We've heard you, you also listed quite a number of things that has been done um, over time. How now let's zoom into again small and micro businesses. If I have less than five personnel that work with me and I do not have fancy operations, right? Even if I lay off two of them, I, I may not have necessarily cut as much cost as would affect you know sustainability in terms of demand how exactly should government how can government in the face of availability of data and all that what are the specific areas that government can adopt to reach these guys at the lower rung of the ladder um so I like the fact that Mr. Papa had, you know, used the scenario of the Apple case, you know, and just having an incubation um, mechanism as well for ensuring that we um, pull together as many as these SMEs possible and bring them to that level where, you know, they are getting direct interface as well with the banks or other financial institutions identified to support. Um, it takes a number of measures as well to get to that level. So using your example now where you say you have um, five employees, you probably paid off two, you still want to reduce costs, but that hasn't quite addressed it. I think the first thing for such an SME is um, just him doing his own, his own homework. You know, there's no one that can do that better for you than yourself. And just always thinking that government has the right solution for me as a business uh, man will, will not be in your best interest. So there are certain things or opportunities that one could take advantage of to manage. Um, funny enough, I was just you know, just before this, I was looking at a proposal that someone had sent to me on Twitter, and you could see that this businessman is trying as much as possible to get to the end goal. But every time when he tries, there's one issue that comes up so that there are even more disruptions even beyond COVID-19 for a typical Nigerian um, SME. But the truth is some of those, the answers lie with, you know, the SME themselves and just being a bit more disciplined, you know, regarding, you know, the way and approach they do things. And um, a good example really is around just financials. We're talking just now about the fact that sometimes you don't have contracts available 
and in some cases you don't even see that some of, some of the SMEs don't even have financials as well that can help them take advantage of some of the measures that government has put in place. Because the truth is that it's all those records that you have and that have, you have kept over time that will be leveraged on for any support that you could take advantage of with the SMEs, uh, for SMEs. That's true. Um, so a good example, even with the UK, so it's not, it's not, it's not uh, um, unusual for any jurisdiction to insist on that kind of documentation. Um, I, I was reading about some of the measures that the UK had put in place for their self-employed and even unemployed people. And they're giving grants as high as um, £4,500 or more. But then it's also subject to you know, documentation that you've submitted for the past three years, tax returns that you filed, um, and being able to de demonstrate that they're actually working capital deficits or you really cannot do this work because of the pandemic that has uh, come up. You know, so documentation is very critical. So, and we need to go past that stage of, I am just a very basic player in the market. I'm a small player. I don't know these things. The way we get financing from some of our friends um, and family, because um, that's a great source of capital for a lot of SMEs, is the same way you can get support, I'll be professionally, from your friends and your families. There are a lot of families that have lawyers in them, they have accountants, they have some of these professional people that they can also leverage on. And sometimes we lose sight of those and just think money is the only thing that's required to grow a business. Taking advantage of those and even into the internet, you know, there are resources, there are templates for even documenting contracts that you can tweak you know, to just make sure you have a simple contract in place. And sometimes it's just understanding the basics, you know, getting insights from trainings such as this or sessions such as this, where you can glean from other professionals without having to pay anything. That helps to gradually build your business. And then as you scale up, you then are able to bridge that gap that may have been created for lack of proper structures or processes in place. And then you can assess some of those measures that government, you know, has put in place. So for that small guy, again, you know, it's really looking inward. There might be other things that, you know, you can address to reduce cost. Cost might not be the biggest thing as well to address. It might just be even your top line. You know, are you even getting any revenues in at all? Has your business model been disrupted because of this um, crisis? Is there anything I can do differently? to bring in new income. Um, a, a good example may be with, you know, some of the retail outlets as well. You know, some of them were stress tests during this period in the sense that you, some of them didn't even have um, online platforms for selling their staple products, whereas this would have been the biggest industry space to have a boom with a lot of people sitting indoors. And then you see some of them becoming innovative using WhatsApp as a method for, you know, driving their sales or driving growth. But WhatsApp was not sufficient. And in other jurisdictions, you'll find that people already have created their internet, their websites, so that they can accommodate the crowd during that period. And that's only what our retail guys are beginning to do at this point in time. So for sites is also very important not just being lax and comfortable where you're, there's a boom. In the period of a boom, we should also be re-strategizing so that when crisis periods like this come, you have a reserve to fall back on. So I'll say that for that small guy, it's not just about the cost as well. It's just also looking at your revenue lines, you know, production and processes, your value chain, revisiting all of those and trying to identify quick wins in the interim and then for the longer haul building a more robust strategy that can take you through as opposed to just focusing on singular items of course because that just creates panic for you and doesn't allow for growth Th thank you so much Celia. yeah i think that 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 uh, that does justice uh, I, I, I'll, I'll go on now to Mr. Pampa. Mr. 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 Pampa, are you there? Yes, I am. We've had um, 
a couple of um, SMEs that now one of the biggest challenges that I've faced that has been uh, for that SMEs face is cost of funding, funding, cost of capital, and all of that, right? You know, and we we naturally is going to get worse because of this pandemic because the ability to pay is going to shrink because um, now costs are increasing, demand is crashing and all of that. What, what are your takes on interest rates? Do you think it's time for the country to review its interest rate downwards? And, and what other options are there really for MSMEs in light of their existing loan vis-a-vis accommodating I think the first thing to, to remark is that interest rates are not arbitrary numbers. They are numbers that are underpinned by a, a, several assumptions that are being made by the central bank, by the banks themselves. So there are a lot of components that go into an interest rate. So it's not as easy as just reducing the interest rate. Like uh, we shouldn't be fooled by the populist move that was done by the CBN that just suddenly cut the interest rate from 9% to 5%. I think what you can get is a rebate or some kind of clawback where Mm -hmm. it is the government itself that is paying your interest, at least some portion of it, or removing some, some part of it. For example, in the interest rate that is charged to SMEs, a good deal of it might be based on um, not, not being able to identify easily who um, the bank is dealing with. What sort of risk are we taking? Who is this individual? Um, how faithful are they in dealing with, with finances and so on? So you'll find that there could be that kind of factor. And if the government is guaranteeing the money, then that's a a component that can be removed by the bank. So I think that the government helping to put a few things, for example, guarantees and so on in place, can help the interest rate to actually then go down um, as close as possible towards single digits. And I think this is the time to do so, especially if we want to jumpstart our production. If we want to get MSMEs producing again and starting, we need to get the money to them. I've already talked about how to overcome the other challenges because their challenges are not financial alone. There's a lot more than finance. But if we have the right partnerships and we have them in the right incubator, and we are able to get the finance to them, then we should worry also about the cost. And if you have the incubator and you have all several other things that help to guarantee um, that you can overcome some assumptions you've made, then you should be able to drop the, the interest rates for the uh, MSME. Over to you then, Ayo. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pampa. Uh, uh, I would I would go now to uh, Mkem. I remember um, I think it was a Siri or that spoke about um, or Tosin that spoke about uh, decision making responsiveness uh, and um, transparency and um, all of that in the in the value chain in the way that we do business. Uh, but there's something else in the digital angle that. Um, affects a lot of SMEs, and that is trust. You know, the level, there seems to be a huge uh, trust deficit between the people and customers, especially in the digital, the customers who use digital channels. And the results are everywhere. We've seen quite a number of e-commerce companies um, either exit the market, merge, or or close shop. Now that we are recommending that more SMEs should migrate to um, digital, using digital channels and all of that. How do you suggest that uh, these you know, our listeners who run SME businesses close this uh, gap 
um, increase the trust levels that their customers have for them. And, you know, what are your closing thoughts? You can share your closing thoughts with us so that we wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I think that the word here is excellence, right? If you um, have excellent products and excellent customer service, your customers will trust you, right? And I think that that's really where it ends and starts. It's not about the channel that people buy on. It's not about um, anything else. It's really about how good are your products and how reliable are you? How, how reliable is your distribution network and your um, delivery as well? right? So if you say we deliver with three hours, make sure you deliver within three hours. If you say you deliver within five days, make sure you deliver within five days. If you um, say that, you know, our products are high quality, make sure our products are high quality. Um, you cannot make empty promises and, and think that you're going to find, um, you know, I think really this is the time for um, you know, companies to make sure that number one, whatever they put on their e-commerce site is actually in stock. Number two, that they have a sufficiently big enough range of products on their site as well. Number three, that the site works properly, right? Um, number four, that there are sufficient various payment channels and that payments can be confirmed either automatically or within very, very short periods of time, right? Um, there has to be a process. E-commerce is not about technology. E-commerce is about customer service. E-commerce is really about the customer experience that the customer has on your site. So once the order is placed, there should be an immediate phone call to the person to say, hi, can you place this order? Um, we just wanted to confirm your address. We wanted to make sure that, you know, these are the products that you've um, ordered. And then you confirm those key details that you need of that customer. You confirm the payment and then you move on. Um, and I also think that it's a little bit wrong to say that um, trust is the major issue why businesses exited the e-commerce space, right? I think we need to dig a little bit deeper and actually unravel some of the layers. We did not have a logistics infrastructure, which meant that the big e-commerce players that came into the space seven years ago had to build that infrastructure. We did not have warehousing infrastructure. They had to build that. We did not have payment infrastructure. A lot of them built that right? Um, delivery networks, distribution partners, all of these things were not available. Um, and that actually took much more money than in any other part of the world where that infrastructure already exists, right? So at some point, when you don't have more cash to burn, you will be forced to exit. When it comes to the smaller players, in, you know, seven years ago, when Konga and Jumia entered the market, we doubled our um, customer base and the majority of new customers that we got were people building e-commerce sites and one of the things that i noticed then was that they had no idea what selling online actually means and how much you have to spend on digital marketing to actually drive traffic to your site so they rushed to build a site without having the knowledge of what next without having the infrastructure in place and that will definitely diminish trust right and it will not get you the results that you're looking for so I think we just need to, you know, be very careful when we um, talk about, you know, the failure of e-commerce across the continent, right? There are many, many factors that have led to that failure. Trust is just one of them, and it's a very small one. So for small businesses that are now looking to build their own e-commerce platforms, it is really, really important to make sure that, number one, as I said, your products are available. Number two, you have reliable delivery partners. There are no stories around pricing for delivery or where you, whether you were not delivered or you did deliver or the delivery came at 11 p.m., all those things are a bad customer experience. So if you actually look at the customer experience and ensure that the customer experience is seamless, you will build trust and you will make sure that people actually are the ones to spread the word, right? They will tell their friends, oh, this is a good company. Oh, they always deliver on time. Oh, they, you know, go the extra mile. The packaging is always nice the bags that they use are neat. Um, in these low touch times, it is also to look at how do you enhance your packaging for a no touch delivery, right? Which means that you probably have to have additional layers of packaging that you can integrate into your um, current delivery packaging to make sure that people can peel off one layer and then have access to safe products that they can consume, right? So there's a lot of thought that has to go into the back end of your e-commerce. It is not technology. Technology is just a platform, 
Anyone can build the technology. It is the processes that drive the success of your e-commerce, right? And I think that that's really important. Um, and then obviously digital marketing um, plays a massive role in the success of your e-commerce. If you do not drive traffic to your site, you will not get customers, right? So the question is always, when I build it, will they come? What are you doing for them to come, right? And I think that that's where we really, um, you know, don't actually understand the massive investment that is required. If we look at, um, you know, the market entry of Honga and Jumia seven years ago, the marketing budgets, this is not just digital, this is marketing cross board nationwide for each of them was about $3.6 million for a year, right? So when you then say, oh, I have 50,000, you are not going to see the massive results, right? So you have to be realistic and you have to be creative, right? It doesn't mean that with a small budget, you cannot build a customer base. You can build a customer base, but this means that you have to take a you have to have you know, a brand story, you have to invest in your branding, you have to invest in your digital marketing, you have to invest in your social media, you have to ensure that responses are fast, you have to ensure that, you know, um, questions are answered immediately, um, you have to ensure that you're engaging your customers. So the work is not the technology, the work is everything around it, the work is the actual selling, the actual customer experience, you know, um, and I think that small businesses just really need to take a step back before building technology and actually look at what is my customer experience like and how do I ensure that that customer experience is seamless because there are enough brands who are selling successfully even without an e-commerce platform they're doing social um, media you know social commerce basically and selling via Instagram and extremely successful they have orders going out every single day um, so trust I think is not the, the real issue it is more around the processes and how we actually ensure that we have great customer service and a great customer experience as well and that our back-end processes are air and water type that we have proper documentation of each single single order that we have inventory management that we ensure that the delivery companies that we work with are, um, are properly equipped with now, right? So those are all things that we need to consider. Um, so yeah, and in terms of my closing thoughts, I think that business owners just simply need to um, now really take time to invest in themselves, get more knowledge around digital um, and how they can actually use digital to automate their businesses um, and to, to enhance their businesses and optimize both their processes and also their customer experience. This is the time to build. This is the time to experiment. This is the time to engage your customers. Everybody is online, right? This is something that will most likely never happen again in our lifetime. So, you know, this is really the time for you to put your best foot forward, to build your brand equity. And when you look at the big brands, that's all they're doing. They are, you know, not yes. focused on selling. They're focused on building brand equity. And that's my message for all small and medium-sized businesses at this point. Thank you very much. So much, Kim. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. You've, you've, you've done justice to the topic. Uh, Again, you know, um, trust is never the only issue. Trust is just an output of a whole lot of um, elements that serve as the input. So all of those things, inefficient processes, um, uh, inadequate uh, or, you know, lack of quality customer service, commitment to excellence. Uh, uh, MSMEs have to ensure that all of these things are top, top notch because you don't have the you may not have the, uh, uh, the advantage of, of scale or the advantage of uh, financial resources. So the best you can do, as Nkem has said, is to commit to excellent customer service delivery and make sure that everything you're doing, irrespective of the size, is top notch so that your customers uh, would always be loyal to you and then you can grow uh, uh, despite the challenges that we have. So I'll go to um, a Siri, then Tosi, uh, then Mr. Pampa for their closing thoughts. So I think we've really shared a lot today on perhaps most aspects of the businesses and, you know, how we can just thrive this period. And maybe I'll just close with um, um, two things or one, which is that, um, you know, this it's from N.S. Shackleton, something I'd um, learned just 
um, attending one of the Harvard business um, sessions, which a lot of SMEs I think should take advantage of now. These are free online. And it says here, a man must shape himself to a new mark the minute the old one goes aground. And this was just coming or leveraging off of the experience that Ernest had with trying to um, discover the Antarctic continent, um, which was a very tasking project at the time for them and would have involved them sailing through ice and probably their ship being you know, stuck on ice and they couldn't get to the end of the pole and all of that. But I think the learning lessons or the life lessons that I think we can also just glean from is the ability for them to toggle seamlessly between day-to-day -day, um, management and just leading you know, the mission, which would be your primary ro um, reason for, 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 for staying a business. You know, what's your vision? What's your mission? Stay true to that. Um, despite the day-to-day -day challenges as well, taking full responsibility for that growth and continually improving on it. I think we've also mentioned that. Discipline to face forward and not just always keep, you know, le um, um, keep thinking about past errors. But then also one thing that stuck or stands out for NS Shackleton is the ability to just you know, be in charge of your people as a leader and be that visionary in terms of humanity and showing care. This is not the time where you want to keep raising your voices and shouting because that doesn't increase productivity. It's really about bringing the strengths of your people together through collaborations and not just your own company or business, but also looking for areas of collaboration with other businesses and identifying innovation in all of this. So again, it's, we must continue to shape ourselves regardless of what's around us and because that's what um, proves the, the strength of any man or woman in any crisis. Thank you, Ayo. Thank you so much, Isiri. Uh, you, you, you've done amazing well, you've done amazingly well for us today. Um, Tosin? Your closing thoughts, please. Okay, thank you, Ayo. Um, I think I would um, just stay a bit around um, contract performance and enforcement again. A um, couple of um, things that I think that people should be mindful of. There are several many ways to get to the other side of the road. And one of the things that I think that a lot of small businesses should try to avoid in this period is dispute or anything that would make you you know, take the limited resources that you have fighting battles in court or in other places. I think that I would um, speak, you know, consistently for continued engagements with your, with your stakeholders and counterparties. People have tended to be a lot more reasonable than expected, you know, from my experience in this period. Um, we've had circumstances as a business where we've had to suspend you know, um, some of the contracts that we had with some of our service providers, even when the contracts that we had with them did not permit us to. But we've, you know, taken the, told the line of, you know, continuous engagement. And we found that, you know, many of them were more than willing, you know, to give, you know, considerate middle of the ground solutions, especially when they feel that, you know, you're not just looking out for your own personal interest. You are open to ensuring that, you know, fair consideration is given to all the parties across board. I would also say that, I mean, a lot of people have talked about, you know, dealing local. There's going to be a lot of, you know, scaling backwards with, you know, some of the obligations, contractual arrangements that we make, you know, with um, counterparties overseas. Now you would see a lot of people, you know, having to deal with other, you know, um, suppliers or, or local service providers, let's be mindful of the peculiarities of dealing, you know, dealing or contracting locally and all the challenges we've spoken about, you know, around infrastructure delays in our court systems, ensure that you have very watertight standard contracts that, you know, protect you even as you, you know, advance and try to you know, um, close, you know, some of these um, engagements. And then finally, I just wanted to mention also that there are many, you know, 
digital legal service channels now that are available where people can avail themselves at very minimal cost, you know, um, finding um, contractual um, documents or agreements that at least give you, you know, the basic protection that you need and where you can for high level or high stake transactions, please use a lawyer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tosin. Uh, thank you so much. You've, you've, I'm sure participants are, have benefited a lot from your uh, wealth of knowledge. Mr. Pampa, please. Yeah, I, I think this is the time for small businesses to consider um, the fact that the reset button has been pressed. It wasn't pressed by them, so they were not ready, but it's a reset button nonetheless. And this is a big opportunity to rethink entire from concept to cash. How do I move what I move in order for it to become cash in the bank? It's a good chance to look through it again. I want to suggest that it's also the time for shared services. That this is the time to look towards the PWCs, the KPMGs, the smaller professional firms, and so on, and say, if we came as 20 small businesses, would you help us do our books? If we came as 40 businesses, would you help us for people to be more compliant, um, to, for people to also meet standards, because people will be more careful the sorts of partners they have in their supply chains? Certainly, if you are not trustworthy and you cannot meet the standards, you'll be weeded out. So it's a time to actually look at the standards that you live up to and get help to achieve it. But it's also a time where there's opportunity. You spoke about, um, a, or somebody mentioned the training company. This is the time to start e-learning, um, delivery of e-learning services taking everything online. Yes, you may not charge as much per person, but you may have a multiplier on the number of persons you can have at the same time and a huge reduction in your costs as well. So it's a time to relook at your model entirely from concept to cash, as I said. Um, I, I think also this is the time to that volume business will make more sense than trying to service one customer or two customers. Because um, reach and ability to get to them is going to be uh, a little constrained from time to time as we go through various cycles of this virus going away, coming back, and so on. We have to accept that it's probably going to be with us at least for the next three years. In and out. So we may have lockdown at any time, disruption to the way we do business at any time, and therefore it's the time to inoculate ourselves against the disruptions that could occur by changing the very fundamentally the business. If we have a chance to uh, reach the policy makers, it's a time to also speak to them about the approach. We really need to fast track help to accept MSMEs at this time. Thank you, Ayo. Thank you so much, Mr. I, what your, your, your closing comments are absolutely brilliant solutions for MSMEs because I've always been worried about the fact that uh, our MSMEs are excluded from the, the bucket or the chain of professional services that exist in the market uh, because of their purchase, because of the, their buying power. I mean, they can't afford PWC, they can't afford KPMG, they can't even afford the medium to smaller size professional services. So uh, they, they, you discover that they are the ones that need these things the most, but they are the ones that are not getting it. And that, this concern was what led to us putting together the Lego SME Bootcamp to train them on all of these basic things. And I really, I, I, I really hope that uh, a series is still on the line and the big firms can um, find a way to deliver these solutions as you recommended. Um, 
I don't know if we still have some time to take questions from our participants. We'll, yeah. If Grace there, yeah, we'll take some questions from the participants, please. Ayo, to the point on PWC supporting, we do have an SME desk as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in fact, we've invested a lot in analysis for SMEs that they can take advantage of. We'll be releasing our maiden report this year on MSMEs, and it has a lot of insights to that they can take advantage of. It includes case studies oh, on successful SMEs and what strategies they've adopted, you know, to succeed in this environment. Um, and just what we should be thinking of as well post, you know, this crisis. So um, we would be doing a webinar shortly for that and a physical launch as well. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, okay, do we, have, do we have questions, please? Okay, maybe while we are waiting for the questions, we will uh, we will do a quick demo of the MSME standards platform for the benefit of our viewers. Yes, thank you very much, Ayo. Um, my name is Maduka Okafo. I'll be taking us through some of the pages from the MSME standards. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Ayo. Um, Siri, Tosi, Kem Delim, and Apampa. It was really, really um, interesting. In fact, you took me back to school. I learned a lot. So I'll be sharing my screen right now. So can you see the screen? Hello? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, yes, so we can. Okay. So the website address is www.msmestandards.com. So um, some of the takeaways from the presenters so far are that um, um, most times the small businesses are ignorant of what they need to do. And also in some cases, they need leverage to actually get what they need to be, um, what they need to do done. So this platform, the MSME standards, provides some of these leverages. Um, Mr. Pampa also mentioned the fact that some of these um, MSMEs need um, people to stand in for them as a form of um, help to get them compliant. I was mentioning the fact that um, on this platform, you can get information regarding the requirements for your businesses as the case may be. If you click on the compliance requirements, you have to get to this page to get to see for each of those um, compliance required. Those requirements you need to get your business compliance. We have them on the platform. and We have partnership with some of these agencies to make sure that these things are constantly updated. And we can also um, have a one-on-one -on -one with um, site visitors and SMEs that may come on board to re require some certain information. Then we also have some tools that will help um, the small businesses also get themselves compliant to um, have that um, trust worthy um, 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 certification, so to say, for them to be able to be given funds for businesses. We also found out that in the course of our research that some of the problems with these um, small businesses is um, because they may not have some certain things put in place for them to be able to do business with. Then if you also go to the certification page here, this is where we have some of the tools available on this platform that help you get compliance. So here you get to check your risk compliance, you check your governance and controls compliance, and all these you do them yourself. There are sets of questions, standardized questions that enables you, when you answer them, it gives you a particular um, um, level of your compliance, the compliance of your organization to know where you begin to seek help. For example, if I come on as a service user here, sorry, this is not a service user. Let me come up with one of the service users here. So I log in as a service user, it is assumed that this person is already registered on the, registered on the platform as an SME. 
So this person wants to find out, for example, what my risk um, assessment as my level of risk assessment, where I am in terms of risk assessment or where I am in terms of the standard I'm supposed to have for my organization. So I click on this, for example, it gives me this set of tools. Now for each of these questions, it also gives me the requirement that I need to have, e.g., under regulatory compliance, I need to have this registration certificate, director CO2 as required, shareholder, and so on and so forth. Then it tells me also whether I fully meet or substantially met or partially met. So, so depending on your response to each of these set of questions, at the end, it gives you a certain um, level where you are regarding your compliance. So all these areas shows that you, also, you need to bridge these gaps. So the good thing about this platform also is that at the end of the day, you can also seek help from the service providers available on this platform. So which also says that, which also means that service providers can come on this platform, register to provide services for these SMEs. So depending on where you are or what you need to bridge the gap to get compliant, the service providers on this platform provide you with those services. Now, some of these services may be paid, some may not be paid. Again, the difference with getting um, service providers on this platform to assist you is that for any of these service providers you pick to provide services for, you don't need to lose sleep over them because they've been vetted, verified, and certified before they come up on this platform. So when you request for service and make payments, if the service is required, if the service requires making payments, they do not get to receive these payments until they deliver the services. Also, you get the opportunity to rate the service provision for these service providers. So if, for example, I require a service um, under regulatory, say under risk assessment, for example, and I'm looking for someone to train me on risk management. So when I search, if there is any organization that provides such services under risk training or risk assessment, I'll have them listed here so that I can engage them to provide services for me. I'm trying to see if any of them has provided um, services they render. None of them so far. But what happens here is once you search for services, if there is any of these service providers that have those services um, uh, um, entered through their own profile page, you are able to see the list of services here and you can engage them to provide those services for you. So in a nutshell, the MSME standards provides you with information that gives you a list of all requirements you need to get your business compliant. It also provides you with some tools, standardized tools, the um, um, COSO standard tools to enable you answer those set of questions and place you or tell you where exactly your organization is and what you need to bridge those gaps so that you are a credible business. And thirdly, it also provides you with access to our e-learning platform where you get to see all the different trainings peculiar to your organizations that you need, including some um, organizational tools like the risk assessment tools and so on and so forth. So you can use as a template to carry out your own activities in-house. Thank you. I have a question here for Tosin. Um, Tosin came and a uh, Siri, I, I think um, I'll start with Tosin. It says, what are the ways in which women can receive support in, their in the business space during crimes, crisis times like the COVID-19 pandemic? All right, Ayo, thank you. Um, interesting question. I, I typically don't like to look at um, you know, support from a, from a gender specific angle. So I, I think um, I would like to remodel the question to say, 
how can businesses you know receive support so whether it's um, it's a business that is driven by women or not but i would also address the fact that you know both um, male and female entrepreneurs should have equal access to financial support stimulus or any kind of you know capital you know support in this period so i i think that one way that we can is um to position ourselves to enjoy the benefits of some of the stimulus that um that um the government has made available i think a series spoke about the nice um facility that is available to small and medium scale enterprises i think that is one i think sometimes you need to also get creative about um um a capital model or structure that can work for your business however small there are also unconventional ways that you can aggregate capital within your own support system or your value chain if you have built you know a sustainable uh, business that is on the back of trust with your customers sometimes you know you'll be surprised that there would be a couple people out there that are willing to put in capital you know to the business that you're doing also there is um, access from um, uh, VCs and other, you know, type investors that um, that look for, you know, value-driven, you know, organizations that have very um, high growth potential and are sometimes willing to, you know, provide seed capital to those kind of businesses. You should, you know, definitely look in that space. Even though we know that, you know, there's a lot of um, um, capital drain in this period there will also be a lot of capital that is looking for people that have you know resilient businesses and businesses that have very you know um, um, high growth potential to you know put money and small small businesses you know are very well positioned to receive this capital because a lot of them you know their overheads are small and they are able to scale very relatively they don't have a lot of you know um, um heavy you know overheads and you know and, and um, structures that would keep them away from being able to be agile or be very you know adaptable in this period so i think um once you look at that i mean banks a lot of banks also have you know some solution that is tailored to um small businesses especially in this period where you know they are considering you know um giving out facility to high growth you know small businesses and some of them are even willing to, you know, take, you know, equity risk with um, such players. I think, I mean, we should be looking, you know, in um, these places. I'm, I'm waiting to see, you know, some of the subnationals also tell, you know, the kind of support that they would be giving to small businesses, particularly in the area of capital. I think they've been inundated with, you know, just trying to deal with um, the follow-on effect of the pandemic. But I'm certain that in no um, um in the nearest future we would see you know a lot of them you know also coming up with um you know solutions as to how you know they would um, support um, small businesses so for me these are some of the areas that i think um, that we should look at i've talked about you know coming up with you know um, not so sophisticated but internal you know capital raise structures amongst your own um, your own um, your own um, 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 value chain customers um clients um family friends and uh, and what have you so i mean that that's it from my end and um i'll be happy to hear what um other panelists would um would um contribute thank you ayo thank you thank you so much uh, okay siri your takes on this please um so i might just add um some of the women support groups are also a good place to um get um, you know, some of this, um, this kind of support and like the women is inspired women um, group, um, Africa women on board, there are quite a number of them and the um, opportunity they offer really is their strength in numbers and some of these organizations have already, you know, collaborated with some financial organizations to support you know, women specifically. So you can take advantage of those groups. They also have, you know, subsections for women in business. Um, Wimbis particularly does a great job at that. So you might want to consider that. Um, some of the private equity funds as well, um, social impact funds 
also tend to have things for women because we they consider that women are very vital to growing economies. When you train a, a girl child, you've trained a village, they say. It's not um, something that's taken for granted. And I think a lot of countries have also grown because of that. You know, closing that gender gap is very important for us as a nation. There was a very unique story there for one of the um, businesses they supported with um, manufacturing pads, sanitary pads for ladies in, um, in the North. So, and again, the only way you might find some of those issues coming through is when there's a woman that's thinking of what another woman doesn't, you know, have or what another woman needs. Um, whilst business, uh, men are good business uh, people, sometimes identifying with those needs can be a bit challenging as well for them. And this is where the strength of the woman is. So you, identifying those kind of social impact funds as well will go a long way in providing that much needed support. Thanks. Hi, okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I don't know. I think Tosin, I think Tosin had to uh, had to leave, so um, I, I may have to take Mr. Pampa. There's a question for you here, please. Um, you say, what's the best approach CBN should take in managing the foreign exchange so it does not have adverse effect on businesses? Before we talk about adverse effect on businesses, we should even talk about adverse effect on the economy. I think the management of our foreign exchange has been very poor up to date. Um, you will find that we have used most of our foreign reserves to intervene on the price of the Naira to try and shore up the Naira at the old exchange rate. And so we were living in a fool's paradise for a long time. Uh, many of the portfolio investors, the, the um, so-called foreign investors, came in to speculate on our market. They bring in $1 and they leave with $1.4. And that $0.4 actually comes out of our foreign reserves. So we have just been depleting the money that has been available. There is no shortcut to it apart from improving productivity because the price of oil, the oil receipts have dwindled and the, um, we, we are not producing at the moment. So until we get all of those things back, I'm afraid there's no magic. We're gonna to have to take the shock of wherever the Naira lands in terms of foreign exchange. I don't think there's any magic the CBN can do because we've depleted our foreign reserves and we don't have the sources to replace the money, which uh, oil would have done if oil had continued in the boom that it was prior to the crash. So I'm sorry I don't have a very helpful answer on that particular score. Ayo. <laughs> well, I, I think in as much as you've said you don't have a help, something helpful on that, but what you've said is also helpful because I mean, the truth is that CBN has to come up with a more sustainable approach to our FX management. Uh, uh, again, as you said, it's, it's mm. really about the economy and not even so much about um, SMEs or businesses to manage. So um, now that Tosin is not here, I think I'll take this to a Siri. Is the Siri still online, please? Yes, I am. Okay. A Siri, somebody is asking if it sees that no matter the business, there is a need for a contract between the employer and the employees and the suppliers, even if you can't afford legal fees. Um, so this is absolutely important. Um, reason being that you couldn't even have engaged your employee or your supplier if you didn't have a contract in the first instance. Contracts don't only have to be written, they can be verbal. And the fundamental is that there is an acceptance, there's an, there's an offer, You've accepted that offer and there's uh, you know, a fee or a price to it. That's the fundamental for any contract. So when it is written, it gives you um, more certainty. It provides or um, allows that there is no subjectivity, you know, or there is no room for someone to then come back and say, no, this was not what we agreed. That is the advantage of having it written. So yes. Yeah, Yes, you should have a written contract if you can afford to do so, do it. You don't need to 
pay a lawyer to write a contract down. Start with the simple and basic steps of saying, what have we agreed to do between the two of us? And what is the price that you are willing to pay for this? Do I agree to that price? Then begin to think about what would happen in circumstances where there are possible disputes. If that person did not finish the work at the date that it was supposed to have been finished, what happens? Do I then say that I will not pay you the amount? Put it in the contract. So that's the very basic step. Now, in terms of the fine lines around how that contract should now be structured, this is where your lawyers will come in. And you already would have tried to reduce that cost by taking that first step in writing your own basic contract. The, also, the good thing about also having the contract is when it comes to, again, communication with banks or even um, financial, other financial institutions for loans, or even the tax authorities, which tend to be one of the biggest problems for Nigerian SMEs as well. Those contracts will become very useful in helping you to get the much needed funds that you need because those will be the fundamentals for any financials that you would prepare. In the absence of any written document, it's unlikely that you'll be able to do your financial reporting properly. And without those financials, the taxman will be very happy to just you know, take the higher end of the stake and then you're left with nothing in terms of returns that you've made. So getting or putting those contracts in place are important. The cost should not be the one that drives you away from doing it because what you stand to gain is much more than that amount that you pay for the legal fees. It's more in terms of those unintended additional costs that you probably hadn't thought of that may come up in the future. So thinking around costs is not just the present, it's also about the future. Yes, th thank you so much, Esiri. Um, I, I think that has done justice to that question. Unfortunately, we can't, um, we won't be able to take Can I jump questions. in here, please? Okay, yes, yes, please do, please do. Can I jump in here, please? Please do, Mr. Pampa. Because this is a very important point. This is where we need professionals to create a pro forma of an employment contract mm. and then help not one SME, but help 20 SMEs or, or help 20,000 if they can put it online and people can buy a form contract, a standard form that they can edit and use. The same thing if you want to set up a contract with your supplier, here is a standard form. And that's why on the MSME standards, they are allowing service providers to join for free and provide these services because there's a great need for all of these things to be simplified. Even um, accounting services being done in batches for the SMEs, except professionals look at these new business models, uh, our SM MSMEs will continue to to struggle, but I support everything that has been said. Thank you so much, Mr. Pampa, for always um, holding the back of our MSMEs uh, with regards to availability and accessibility of services, professional services for them. I, 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 I can't thank you enough because uh, this is one area that is very close to my heart. Um, okay, so uh, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, and even if we do, sadly, we run out of time. So um, I will just go on to CBI Nigeria to give us uh, the closing remarks and appreciation. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, it looks like the people from CBI Nigeria have disappeared. Um, I see. Yeah. <laughs> since I I'm affiliated with the organization, I better <laughs> thank everybody on behalf of the organization, starting with you, Ayo, for the excellent moderation. Um, I want thank to so thank much, uh, Nkem as well, Isiri, and everyone, um, and Miss Adjus Miss Adjuse as well for all of the contributions so far. We're really very grateful for the time that you have taken to make this happen. This has been very rich. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thanks especially to ProShare. <laughs> yeah, thank you, ProShare.
Thank you, Porsche. Thank you, Web TV and MSME standards.